The following interview was conducted with Professor Paul L. Zemer for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, um, March the 28th, 2008, at its residence in Lafayette, Indiana. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. <coughs> Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and okay, siblings yeah. in early years. Oh, very good. Uh, I was born in Toledo, Ohio, 1935. Uh, my, my mother was an immigrant from the Netherlands. My father grew up in Ohio, so he was a local boy, as it were. Uh, I lived all my early days in Ohio and still have relatives there. My sister still lives there, and uh, my stepmother is there. So uh, that's sort of hometown, hometown right, for us, yeah. right? right. Uh -huh. um, I left, in a sense, left Ohio to go to college. I went to Wheaton College, which is in Illinois, which is where I met my wife, Marilyn. We were both students at Wheaton. I met in the concert band, and uh, she was a year behind me, but after she graduated, and I was in graduate school at the time at Vanderbilt, we got married. I was completing my master's work at Vanderbilt at, at that time, and uh, that work was actually done at the laboratory at Oak Ridge, uh, Tennessee, Oak mm -hmm. Ridge National Lab. So our first year of marriage, we lived in Oak Ridge, and I completed that master's work, and we were prepared to move to New York, uh, Schenectady, New York, where I had accepted a position at the Knowles Atomic Power Lab. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, we, we had completed our term at Oak Ridge, completed the master's work. We had actually rented an apartment in Schenectady and had arranged for the movers to come on a Monday morning, and that Friday, there's Marilyn, that, that Friday, I'll interrupt the, this, introduce Marilyn. Marilyn, this Hi. is Catherine. Hi there. Mm -hmm. You're welcome to join us. She, yeah, she's she's actually going to a funeral memorial service. One of our former students uh, died recently, and she's going to that. So I will see you later. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, the Friday before we were to move, I got a call from the lab. They had lost their contract, the contract under which I was being hired. So they said it would be fine if I came, but the job was going to terminate one month later. So, so we, we didn't go. But the folks at Oak Ridge were very kind, and they said, you can stay here on an inter interim basis until you find something. And uh, later that summer, um, there was a job posting from Purdue University. It was, was John Christian. And I know you have interviewed right. John. Yes, I did. Thank you. And at that uh, point, they were uh, advertising for the position of radiation safety officer, or what they called radiological control officer. And since my training at Vanderbilt and Oak Ridge had been in the area of radiation safety, this was the perfect position for me. And it had an added incentive, which I had not previously considered, and that was the opportunity to take courses also and move toward a PhD. This had not been in my career plans before. I was going to complete my academic career at the MS level and go into really uh, the private sector, as it were. The real world. <laughs> well, a the different world, world at right. least. <laughs> I'm not sure how real that is either. But in any event, uh, that, uh, that opportunity arose. I came to Purdue. I interviewed with John Christian. What year uh, now? What year was this? This would have been 59. I might add, uh, sort of parenthetically, uh, John and his wife uh, Kay had just recently moved into their home, which was the Frank Lloyd Wright home, which was kind of an added attraction for me to, to interact with the person living in that home. But in any event, uh, the, the job was offered, and I accepted it. And Marilyn and I moved here in the fall of 59. We had a two-week-old, our first child, Sandra, was born just prior to that in Oak Ridge. We moved up here and got underway. So, Could, we, I, could I interrupt? Yes. Tell us a little bit about college and how it was working at Oak Ridge in those days and how to tell why. Okay, yeah. yeah. I, this is, uh, I'm going to actually insert something here because when I graduated from college in, in 57 from Wheaton College and I had majored in physics, I actually had accepted a position and was working at the Naval Research Lab in Washington. I had been on an internship the prior summer after my junior year 
So I went back to Naval Research Lab when this, an opportunity for graduate school for radiation safety studies was offered by the what was then the Atomic Energy Commission. And at that time, since this was the, the early phase of the Atoms for Peace program and the big thrust for building nuclear reactors in the U.S., and I know at the same time, although I didn't know it, know it, that John Christian had just gotten underway with what the predecessor to the bionucleonics program, they had an area in pharmacy called bionucleonics research that you probably talked with him about. Sure, understand. So that was going on here, the radioisotope studies, all of that was growing, an exciting new area. At Naval Research, the thing that was going on was the Vanguard project, because the U.S. had not yet put a satellite into space. So it was in that framework, and we were at Naval Research working on some of some aspects of that, and that was also very exciting. But the fellowship opportunity arose with the Atomic Energy Commission in this area called uh, they called it then radiological physics, and I didn't really even know what it was at that point, but uh, I applied and received that fellowship, took a leave of absence from Naval Research Lab, went to Vanderbilt, then to Oak Ridge, and I never did get back to the Naval Research Lab. I ended up then, as I described, at Purdue. Okay. So that was sort of the interesting gotcha. set of yeah. events that moved me into a completely different direction than I had originally planned. Okay. So. Okay. Now you're at Purdue, so, uh, and you were the radiological control officer. Go ahead and tell us a little bit about that. Well, about in those days, the, the use of radioisotopes was just underway. John Christian was the first one on campus to use those. He began a teaching program to teach the use of radioisotopes. They wanted to add a radiation safety component to that, and so one of my first responsibilities, although I came here, as radiation safety officer, I also had an appointment as an instructor. Full-time instructor was the appointment. And in those days, instructors were considered part of the faculty. They, they aren't any longer, but uh, in those days they were. So, so I was actually technically on the faculty, and I began teaching a course in radiation safety. The terminology used is health physics. That was a, the professional term that came out of the, the old Manhattan Project. Uh, you, if I use that term, you understand that's the, the project at the University of Chicago where Enrico Fermi developed the first uh, atomic reactor, really. And the, the physicists who were involved in looking after the health of the workers were called health physicists. So, that's uh, good because researchers, when they hear that term, if they're reading the transcript, this clarifies for them so they understand. Right. So there was a physics group in, in the Manhattan Project that was given the responsibility for looking after the health and safety of the radiation workers, and that terminology uh, grew out of that. So we uh, set up some courses in health physics at that time, as well as the radio tracer courses that John had been teaching. And then, of course, the bionucleonics department came into being in the fall of, fifth, or actually July of 59, and I arrived here in August, or 1st of September, really and began that fall term. So it was exciting times in terms of uh, both uh, the space program in the U.S. and the nuclear program in the U.S. So uh, I ended up on the, the nuclear side then. And, and uh, What was there. campus like when you arrived? Um, my recollection is that there were about 18,000 students, so obviously it's half less than half as big as it is now. Um, there were... The building I worked in was called the Pharmacy Annex. Now, that was one of those FWA buildings, and it was the last one to be torn down this last year. Was it's the one on right the... across from Civil Engineering, right next to what is now Schliemann Hall. But Schliemann was, at that time, was the pharmacy building. Uh, Glenn Jenkins was the dean of pharmacy, and he was really John Christian's boss, so I indirectly reported uh, to... Uh, John or to Glenn Jenkins through through John Christian. So, and uh, the, uh, the other other things were the, some of the traditions have changed. Those were the days when the the seniors wore the senior cords with all the pictures on them and and that sort of thing. 
Uh, you could drive through campus. The, uh, the the streets were open in the front and hall. And you could drive in front of Hubdy Hall. Uh, Hubdy Hall and park there and so on. Sure. And Marilyn and I were able to buy a house on Hay Street right across from campus where the parking garage and visitor center sits now. So that's that's where I lived, and it was about 90-second walk to my office <laughs> in the pharmacy annex. But, uh, oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Now, then you became associate head of the health sciences when the school was established, right? Right, so Tell right. us about the teaching and things and your students' curriculum. Yeah, well, the, um, the School of Health Sciences really grew out of uh, uh, co combining several components on campus, and I, I don't know how much of this description well, you've you had before, but... might but, benefit by, yeah. we'll leave it up to you. Well, prior to, the, prior to that, we had the bionucleonics program, which had expanded from just the nuclear, and we had a big environmental health component at that time, so we had radiation safety, environmental health, and uh, getting a little bit into the toxicology areas. And there were some other areas on campus that were health-related. And at that time, the administration thought it would be useful to try to bring some of the health components together because they were scattered around. You had the bionucleonics group in pharmacy. Uh, medical technology was over in biology. So that was a, another sort of health-related group. Uh, and there were others. Uh, now, physical education, did they have some health things in there? Right, okay. kinesiology and, and that sort of thing over in phys ed. <clears throat> of course, speech therapy was going on. Now, the efforts to bring all the health things together, was uh, that couldn't be fully realized. There's still turf issues amongst the deans. What was brought together was the bionucleonics program and the med tech program. And at the same time, nursing moved out of technology and became a separate school. So what was done in 79 was to take those components and make the health science group and then the nursing group and then the pharmacy. And those were put under one common dean. The dean of pharmacy became, and that would, would have been Tip Tyler, or Vero E. Tyler at the time, right. became the dean of pharmacy, nursing, and health sciences. So there were three sister schools established at that time. And um, that, uh, th that gave a little more health-related focus. And I think in part uh, that was also a marketing strategy for students interested in health issues. So uh, we were able to establish uh, programs, uh, the BS, MS, and PhD level in, in the radiation sciences and environmental sciences. Those are the main focuses, plus the med tech, which was a, a BS program, which basically involved three years on campus and one year in a, a medical facility where they got their hands-on training. So that was... That was the configuration at that time. How did oh, uh, how, the student enrollment did that increase, and where, and how the graduate work also increased? Well, we had uh, we had the bionucleonics program itself originally was a graduate program, strictly a graduate program in pharmacy, and in the early seventies, because of tremendous federal support in both the radiological and the health sciences, we had in the range of 50 to 60 graduate students in that bionucleonics program. So that was a pretty large component. In, in the mid-70s, we added the environmental health component. I don't recall the exact years, but say middle 70s. So we had started an environmental health BS program in bionucleonics in the mid-70s. So that, that became part of the new School of Health Sciences. The undergraduate program was largely environmental health and then we began to add undergraduate programs in the radiation safety area. And, of course, then the med tech was also an undergraduate program. So there was a, a good cadre. I think med tech a pretty, was a pretty large. That was the largest of the undergraduate groups at that time. And then we added a, a group which we called general health sciences, which were folks originally who, who couldn't quite make it in the more professional areas, uh, and it, it became sort of a, a default area if you <laughs> weren't quite up to snuff. Later, that changed and became the place where people who were very interested in, in 
pre-professional programs, pre-med, pre-dent, all of those areas. So now general health sciences is a, a program that is uh, the students are at a much higher level than it was originally configured sure. and it, it has evolved over time to be the area where the pre-professional people go so right pre-dentistry yeah. or pre-med pre-med or... uh, pre-physical therapy all of those programs so they have a very uh, skilled group of students sure. in there now where originally it was kind of the fallback if you couldn't make it uh, but you wanted something you, in health right right Okay. And then, and now in more recent years, and really this is in the last five years or so, they're getting uh, more involved in in um, public health, or adding public health courses, and they've gotten a little bit into the forensics area too, which you may be aware of. So th there's been other programs added, and the, and the student student body enrollment has continued to increase. Graduate enrollments decreased in the late '80s and into the 90s, partially because uh, we had a big nuclear component and the nuclear power industry was going down. That's when nuclear engineering was going down. Now, that's turned around the last five years now. Mm -hmm. but, uh, and, of course, now they also have a pretty good program in, in the toxicology area. Mm -hmm. uh, Gary Carlson and some of his colleagues. So, are doing that, right? Yeah. Right. So the, the graduate student enrollment is back up. Uh, I don't know the exact numbers now, but in the undergraduate enrollment's very strong. Right. So, so the numbers are, are increasing. That's good. Yeah. Uh, now you become the head of health, the School of Health Sciences, and what challenges and well, in, opportunities? Well, actually, in uh, that that you're taking us to about '83. Is I, was there was there was a little interim period, oh, okay. and then in '83, and w we had some what I'll describe as difficult years early on, uh, there were some internal problems, which I'm not going to describe to you very much today, other than to say that there were some disagreements as to what role health sciences should have and, and what the status of its graduate program should be. And in the early part of that, in the 80s, uh, Dr. Tyler decided that the graduate program should largely be administered, co-administered by medicinal chemistry, which was part of the School of Pharmacy. So we had kind of an, what I will call an awkward situation where we were a separate school, but our PhD program was under the jurisdiction of uh, a department of pharmacy. But but uh, we, we were able to sure. bridge that. Uh, you can I, I, th I think uh, a lot of this is uh, just um, the way the administration wanted to mo monitor what was being done because of some difficulties they had had with, with um, certain aspects of the program and some criticisms that had been made both internally and externally of some of the parts of the program. So uh, we, uh, we rode that out, as it were, and, and the program still was in that configuration uh, when I, I left in, I took a leave of absence in 1990 to, to go to Washington, where I was for several years. When, when my time in Washington ended, and it ended on uh, Inauguration Day for Mr. Clinton because I <laughs> had to be out of my office at that point since it was a presidential appointment under President Bush. But um, um, from at that point, uh, the, the search committee to fill my position had not been successful and the, the position was still open. It was still being covered by an acting head, which was Dr. Shaw. And, and at that time, uh, the dean invited me to consider coming back as head again. And one of my uh, requirements was that the, they separate, fully separate the graduate program, which they did shortly after I returned, mm -hmm. so that uh, they, we had an autonomous uh, graduate program in health sciences then beginning shortly after my return in 94. Okay. Yeah. Tell us, can you tell us a little bit about the year? experiences in Washington for the researchers and 
what, what all it was. Well, that was a great experience for me, actually. Um, how did you hear? Did they someone? How did you get the initial contact? Uh, it, it's very interesting and curious. And the the bottom line is, I don't fully know. I I was in my office one day in December of '89 at Purdue. And I got a phone call from an individual. He identified himself by name, and he was the deputy secretary of energy. He, the, the new secretary of energy in 89, after, uh, when, when uh, the first Bush administration uh, came into place, um, was uh, Admiral James Watkins. He was a retired Navy admiral, had been appointed secretary of energy. He incidentally had a... a engineering background. He was a technical person as well as a Navy person. And so this, the person who called me was uh, the deputy for Admiral Watkins who was on the secretary's, or was on the president's um, uh, cabinet, is the right word here. So he said they were interested in having me consider a position as an, as, as an assistant secretary. Now this is out of the blue, so I had no idea. I didn't know this individual. I didn't know where he got my name. But I, he said, can you come to DC and we'll interview you for the position? And I said, sure. And that interview occurred about a week later. Now I'm, I'm used to the search process at Purdue, which is long and tedious. And when we interview some, somebody, they come in and they talk to all kinds of people along the way and they do all kinds of things and entertain them and so on. So I got to Washington. I met briefly with the guy who called me. And then we went in and met with the Secretary of Energy. And after about 15 minutes, he said, uh, if you're interested, the job is yours. So it, it was that quickly. And I had, and prior to going, even taking that trip, I said, well, what, you know, I have not applied for anything, and I don't know you. What do I need to bring? Do you need my resume or what do you need? He said, we, we know everything we need to know about you. <laughs> so, so that There's was nothing that. I can add, right? <laughs> right. So uh, don't even bother bringing your resume. So uh, that, was, that was the sequence that uh, was uh, very new and different to me. Uh, I did uh, accept the position. Uh, was able, uh, Purdue was uh, kindly granted a leave of absence, and so, which they continued on a yearly basis. So I was able to, um, from that from that point, and there there's a process that uh, you, you, you have to go to through Senate confirmation, just like the cabinet. So that's a long, tedious process. There's an FBI investigation first. So from early in the year to later in '90, and although I was going in every week to to the Department of Energy and spending several days a week there. I did it at the front end as a consultant until the confirmation came through. And that was an, a, a less controversial process than at the cabinet level. At the, at the cabinet level, it gets very controversial. The next level down for the so-called assistant secretaries, and every agency has many. So out here in Indiana and, and to my colleagues, they're, they're always very impressed by that title and so on. But in fact, in Washington, D.C., assistant secretaries are a dime a dozen. <laughs> so it's not, not that big a deal. I, our agency had about 10 assistant secretaries for various areas. There would be assistant secretary for, for uh, defense programs, which is the nuclear weapons, an assistant secretary for energy research, an assistant secretary for for um, high-level waste disposal, in my case, assistant secretary for environment, safety, and health. And they were interested in exactly the same things that uh, we studied at Purdue, radiation safety, environmental health and safety, um, and uh, occupational safety and health. So the areas w were a perfect match for me, and it was a matter of applying them 
not in a little university setting, but throughout the complex, which is all of the national laboratories around the country, Oak Ridge National Lab, Brookhaven National Lab, Argonne National Lab, Los Alamos, and Rocky Flats, and all of the, the facilities around the country. And the big, the big change for me was going from my little budget at Purdue, which is a million or two in health sciences, where the uh, Department of Energy has an 18, at that time had an 18 billion dollar budget, and my part of the budget was about 300 million. <laughs> this was, this was a big, big change uh, in dealing with in big ways, in in very big ways. So there was a high learning curve in, uh, for me in terms of how the government operated. Because you're you're basically everybody under you are. Our civil servants, so they know how the system runs, and they've been there. A they while. they know how to run it, in spite of what you may do. But we we were able to. Um, I was able to interact, I think, quite well with my various deputies, and and we got a lot done in, mm -hmm. in the years that I was there. That did you have to visit? Did you visit the labs? Too? Oh yes, oh. yes. We had okay. a lot of interactions out in the field with with the various facilities, and uh, at at that time there were. Um, uh, a lot of a lot of things going on in the environment, safety, and health area for for uh, the federal labs because prior to about prior to uh, Secretary Watkins coming into position, the labs pretty well said that they were exempt from environmental laws and occupational safety laws. They did what they wanted, and and Secretary Watkins said that's not going to happen anymore. So. Uh, he was very supportive of what we were able to do, and so that he was, saw the need and needed to be taken care and, of. And and he had a mandate from Congress to do that. So uh, there was uh, a, a lot of effort and a lot of support for what we were doing in the environment, safety, and health arena uh, during those years. Mm -hmm. So so that was good. Yeah. Where did you? Uh, how did you like being in Washington? Was, had you been there before? I'm sure for well, and as I told you, my I, I started out right, and I graduated right. to sure. living in Washington, sure. and so it was, it's a city I've always liked, and it was kind of uh, ironic to return there many years later and right. and to live there again. I had lived there. Where did you did you live in Virginia when you were? Uh, we right? lived in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, we lived fairly close in to. Uh, uh, from I was only about ten minutes from our our building was down on the mall, uh, so the Forestall building is right across from the Smithsonian. So, and I had an office on the seventh floor, which is the top floor of that building. Big picture windows looking out over the old castle and the gardens of the Smithsonian. So Great view. It's hard to get work done with a view like that. <laughs> don't look out the window, yeah, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. Don't look out the window. Oh. But, but, yeah, that was great. And, and uh, the whole culture of Washington is very different. There's uh, a lot of attention given to um, protocol and interacting with people at different levels. Uh, we're used to here... Uh, you know, uh, an assistant professor can easily walk over and talk to the president if you want. It's very hard, much more difficult to do something like that sure. in Washington. There, there's all these uh, very sensitive to the level of who's going to be at a meeting. When a meeting is called, uh, if if someone asked me to go to a meeting, the first thing I learned I had to find out was who's going to attend from the other the group you're meeting with, if it's not at the same level, you know, the assistant secretaries only meet with other assistant secretaries and their staff, or, or the, the secretary of energy is not going to meet with an assistant secretary at health and human services. It's got to be at the same level, or it's, uh, so that, that kind of protocol is a little hard to get used to, you know. You so. have to read, read the writing on the wall, That's or right. something like that. That's right, right. right. Well, then, then uh, did you, you didn't say for the inauguration? Did you, had you left before then? For the, when Which, Clinton, uh, uh, I, actually, I did. Oh. Uh, Mar Marilyn and I were, uh, the, the inauguration morning, we were packing up the final boxes and moving them out of the office and into my car. Um, one of the perks I had was a 24-7 was a parking place 
uh, there at the Forestall building, so you we, we, that. we could use that all the time. And uh, we packed up the boxes and then walked across the street for the inaugural parade. Very <laughs> so, good, perfect. Yeah, what so, could be better? Yeah, right. Well, so, then, but even on occasions like July Fourth, the fireworks and so on, always had a parking place. That was great. <laughs> oh. it's, it's like campus, you know. The best perks are parking. <laughs> if you can find one, if right? You can find Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> mine was reserved, so that was a good deal. Oh, well, then you came back to Purdue, right. which is nice. Then you came back as a head. <clears throat> and did you make any um, changes? In well, we you stayed on until you retired. Right. Huh? We, we began to uh, emphasize the toxicology area. This, this was the point at which we brought Gary. Carlson into our program. Gary had been a toxicologist in pharmacy, but pharmacy was reconfiguring how they were doing things and they were getting more into the molecular pharmacology and and uh, so we had the opportunity to add environmental toxicology to our program so and Gary was our initial hire there for that and uh, that's grown since so uh, the increased emphasis on the tox area. And then the other thing we did was begin to emphasize uh, the, the medical physics area. The early collabor collaborations were with the med school, and at the med school, George Sanderson was, was um, the person uh, that I interacted with. So we brought George Sanderson on in, in, that, uh, uh, in those days as, as a visiting professor of medical physics and we developed the medical physics correct curriculum and now of course George uh, now is the head of health sciences and they have a very flourishing mm -hmm. medical physics program so why don't you t uh, can you make a comment on what medical physics is so researchers yes. would understand um, right uh, in in hospitals nowadays you have a lot of instrumentation that I will broadly call imaging equipment. Uh, the, the primary in imaging equipment early on was, of course, x-rays, and then later CAT scans. And then you added to that imaging equipment that made use of nuclear pharmacy techniques and uh, uh, the so-called PET scans, where you inject a person with a radioactive substance and then scan them rather than uh, take x-rays and, and image them. So. So all of those scanning things, and, and of course now we have MMR too, which is really, uh, or uh, magnetic uh, scans, but all of those scanning techniques required not only medical people to interpret the scans, but physicists to make sure that the, the instrumentation and the methodology was done correctly to, to gather the data for the physician to use. Uh, this even goes back to early x-ray times. Hospitals almost always had physicists on their staffs to, to assist the, the radiologists. And as scanning became more and more important, uh, hospital staffs built up uh, physics departments just to, to handle, handle the, the imaging issues. So, for example, at the Med Center, George Sanderson was the chief medical physicist. He's trained as a physicist, but uh, is assisting with the imaging process. In the imaging process, they also have a lot of computer assistance now. The imaging is not done right. just with a film anymore. It's all uh, digitized and, and the images are constructed with computer programs. So you have a lot of computer people as well as the physicists, or sometimes it's both uh, rolled up into one person, but uh, that's that's the role, and their backgrounds uh, to a certain point are the, similar to the health physicists in that they need to know uh, various types of radiation, how they interact in the body in terms of biological interactions, how you detect them, how you interpret what you're detecting, and then the health physicists go in the direction of assuring that the workers are working at safe levels because they are getting exposed often in the process of taking the images. And the, the simple example would be an x-ray tech 
as a minimum you say get behind the shield when you're exposing the patient now you, people say well if the if it's safe for the patient why isn't it for the tech well the, the tech is going to get exposed over and over and over and over so you want them to be right. uh, protected, at protected. All. And there's other ways of protection, but the, uh, shielding would be an example. So uh, a medical physicist or a, a health physicist is looking at the safety part of it, and then the medical phys physicist is helping make sure the image they're collecting is suitable for diagnosis. And so at a facility like IU, they have a whole medical physics staff, and then they have a whole health physics staff. Uh, taking care of both facets of that. So we're training people now for both, and the early parts of that training, they are all, all around the same um, course curriculum, and then they specialize, right. as, depending on which direction they're going to go. They want to go, go. Yeah. okay. And, and some actually are, are conversant in both. Actually, George Sanderson himself started out in England in the safety arena, and then he went back and specialized in the medical. So okay. you, can, you can be both, but... Often in a medical, a large medical facility, they have a... Just more of a specialization. Yeah, because they have to have large staffs to cover those, right. yeah. Well, the mm -hmm. placement for the graduates must be quite it's, good. It's very good. Uh, imaging, of course, is growing. Right. And so there are more and more. And in, in, in that in health science now is really the uh, the growing edge is, is the medical physics part. Right. Yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah. Um, did we make a couple comments about the radon levels that you did the study on? Yes, well, you may recall, and this this goes back to, uh, well, now, it goes back about 25 years when people became aware of radon as a problem. Radon, of course, is a gas, and it's, it's a daughter product of radium, which in turn comes from uranium. And many people don't realize uranium is present virtually everywhere. You, if we went out into the yard here and dug up a bucket of soil and analyzed it, you'd find a little Sorry. radium or uranium and radium there. So it's pretty well everywhere. And the problem that arises is that uh, the, the, ra the radon is a gas. It's a noble gas like xenon and krypton. And so it can migrate as a gas, whereas radium and uranium are pretty well fixed, say, in the soil. But um, when... When that so-called decay chain process occurs, the uranium, when it decays, becomes some other things. It eventually gets to radium, and then radium decays into radon. At that point, that gas can diffuse from where it was sure. located, and it gets up. And if you're, uh, almost any home will have some radon in it because it's diffused up through the floor and into the basement and up the rest of the house. So there was a sort of an accidental discovery in the late, late 70s in Pennsylvania. Um, a guy who actually worked in a nuclear power plant and he kept setting the alarms off and they thought he was contaminated from the plant and they had began to investigate it and found that he was bringing in radioactivity from his home. It was a result of the, not the radon gas, but the radon itself decays to other things which are also radioactive. And he was, he was bringing that in, and his house had an extremely high level of radon in it for some reason. It, you know, part of it was the geological structure there in Pennsylvania, the, the granite, I think it was. Uh, it's in an area called the Redding Prong, which is a, a geological uh, structure under that part of Pennsylvania, and it gives up a lot of radon gas. So, Anyway, people, the EPA started looking around the country at radon levels, and we got interested in it here. I had a number of students do some studies. Actually, parts of Lafayette are on some geological structures that are somewhat elevated. We did a lot of readings around this area. They're, they're not alarming, but uh, some elevated areas. And then um, also looked at some other techniques for measuring radon more efficiently. So over a number of years, I've had a number of students do different projects on measuring radon, evaluating it, and that sort of thing. It's it's an ongoing public health issue, but do you hear very much about it? Or well, the, from, the, a, from the, a consumer or a, uh, here yeah. here's the difference though. If 
if you had radioactivity in your home and it's due to uh, a nuclear power plant down the road, you will be very angry. But most people don't get very upset from natural radioactivity, even though it may be even higher than, say, uh, uh, some man-made thing, because of our perception of risk is very different if it's a natural risk versus a man-made risk. It's very interesting, people living around Three Mile Island, and I've seen some interviews on uh, video interviews of some of the people who are, were very upset about the Three Mile Island accident because of some very small exposures that they received as neighbors to that plant. And they were asked if they had ever measured the levels of radon in their home because that's a high radon level in, in Pennsylvania anyway. And they said, no, they weren't concerned about radon. Well, you see, it's sort of God's radiation and man's radiation or something like that. Um, the EPA has had a very difficult time getting people concerned about radon levels, even though the, the, um, the uh, I'm saying Secretary General, the Surgeon General, has said that radon is the second leading cause of lung cancer behind cigarettes. But people do not get very excited about it. Interesting point. And they don't, you don't hear much about it. No, in fact, uh, probably the only time you hear about it is if you try to sell your house and the buyer says, I want you to measure radon levels. Um, and if, if they're above the, the, the recommended limit, which is... Uh, four units, four picocuries per liter, then you'll have to do something about it. And I didn't but, even know, right? <laughs> yeah, but otherwise, no, people don't get very excited yeah. about it. But it, it's been an ongoing sure. uh, public health issue, and, and so we got involved in it uh, in the 80s and uh, had, over the years had a number of students do some appropriate projects right. in that okay. area. Yeah. Um, let's talk about uh, President's Council. You've been involved with that, and how about athletics? Did you? You're well, about? yeah, I can talk about both. Uh, okay. Well, President's Council is. Um, I'm not active in that from a uh, an organizational point of view. You you get you're in the President's Council if you're a donor. Um, Marilyn and I have been supporters of Purdue in many ways for many years. Uh, We've been John Purdue Club people for many years. Uh, uh, we've given regularly to the School of Health Sciences. Uh, more recently, we've made some donations uh, to the school to uh, help establish some, some programs there. Um, the giving but, back is very good. Right, right. Uh, as far as athletics are concerned, why uh, we're big supporters, we... We have had season tickets in football since '59, with the exception of the years we were in uh, in D.C. And we are also big uh, supporters of women's athlete uh, athletics. Uh, we have four daughters. Our oldest daughter was uh, a swimmer at Purdue, varsity swimmer, so she was supported by athletics at Purdue. But we were season. I bet she enjoys the new pool. Oh yeah, well. Uh, she she doesn't live in Lafayette anymore, yeah, so she hasn't had much it. chance. But she swam in the old pool, <laughs> yeah. That's all right. In the in the early sure. days of women's uh, sure. women's sports support, but uh, yeah, we're season ticket holders for volleyball and for for basketball, and uh, so uh, we've we've. Did you go longer. last weekend to the? Oh yes, yeah. oh yes. We, I wa I wasn't we, there. I yeah, watched yeah. it and pulled for them. Yeah, and they we, did. They did pretty well. They, they did. They did reasonably well. The first half of the Tennessee game was a little frightening, but they they came around the second half. But a little but talk at halftime. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, we're we're big, we're uh, sports fans, as it were. It's a know. nice tradition. Yeah, you know, yeah. right. Um, you got a couple of awards. One of the ones was that Tony and Mary Holman Achievement Award. Uh, that's an award that the state of Indiana gives, right. and you recognize the Holman's name, and they have endowed uh, uh, this award that's given annually, uh, and it's to, for, uh, it's focused on environmental health and things of that sort. Uh, somebody nominated me, I'm not even sure who it was, uh, for that, because of our our work in Very health nice. sciences and the environmental areas, so it was an, it was a nice 
Award yeah. from the, it, it gave recognition to the Purdue program. Really, right. is what it was. How do they do they let you know? They just give you a call. Um, I th I think initially there <clears throat> there was a a letter and and an invitation to a banquet where the award would be given. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then I was there and said, "Oh, that's me, right?" <laughs> well, it, it wasn't. It didn't. I mean, uh, you knew in advance that you were going to receive the award, so yeah. it wasn't like come to this banquet and oh, there's a surprise, yeah. So, <laughs> how about uh, retiring? What tell us about some of the share a couple of those things that you've been doing? Oh, uh, retirement is uh, turns out to be a busy time, and, and you probably run across this a lot. Um, I have maintained uh, a fair amount of professional activities during retirement. Uh, the main one of which is uh, in in 91, which was basic, or 91, 2001, uh, the, the year I retired, I was invited by this White House, uh, George Bush, to chair an advisory board, which is called the Advisory Board on Radiation and Worker Health. Uh, that advisory board is still operating, and I'm still serving in that capacity. Uh, the members of the board, it's a 12-person board, and you are actually given the, the status of a special government employee, which means you get paid a, a standard federal consulting rate, and you cannot work more than a certain number of hours a year, but you, you're a federal employee, and you get paid, and you get a W-2 form. So, so that's my sort of... Uh, main thing in the last uh, almost seven years now. Uh -huh. uh, that board meets fairly frequently. We have, in the last seven years, we've met 50 sometimes. So we, we're meeting um, about every other month. Those meetings are uh, three days in, in length. <clears throat> they are public meetings. And the, the program that's involved is a federal compensation program for former nuclear weapons workers and it's focused on their health if they get uh, uh, cancer and have worked in an, one of a number of specified laboratories in the past they can petition for compensation there's certain rules they ha have to be met in terms of getting the, the compensation is a lump sum, 150000 if they are successful. And um, since this program started, there have been <coughs> probably 25,000 claims so far. Um, they're not all successful. The success rate is, however, is probably close to 30%. So there's a lot of claims, a lot of, a lot of money has been paid out to uh, these individuals. Uh, this this program um, is predicated on the assumption that many people were not properly protected in the year, early years. Well, even in perhaps in the later years of the atomic weapons program, in the rush to build nuclear weapons, there was. Uh, perhaps shortcuts taken in safety. And so it's predicated that some of these workers, their cancers may have been due to radiation exposure. You can't, you can never prove one-to-one -one that it is. Right. And it's a very uh, claimant favorable program in that it, it probably, if you have, if you have, 10 individuals making a claim, 10 individuals that get cancer making a claim, uh, it will probably, and, and let's say one of those, the, the claim really, the, the cancer was due to their exposure, you'll probably pay off about nine of them to make sure you don't miss the one, because they make a lot of claimant favorable assumptions about exposure conditions and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so our advisory board is responsible. The program is administered by the Department of Labor and by Health and Human Services and National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. And our board is responsible for kind of looking over the shoulders of the federal agencies and making sure that they are 
uh, following the proper procedures in uh, adjudicating these claims and also uh, one of the requirements for the successful claims is that uh, Health and Human Services has to gather their uh, the records of their radiation exposures and do what's called a dose reconstruction and then using some some information from the National Cancer Institute they calculate what's called a probability of causation and it's kind of it's like a legal term is it more likely than not that their cancer was caused by the radiation and there's certain procedures scientific procedures they have to follow to make that determination so we're we we audit what they do we audit the claims so we we sample uh, we don't we don't process the claims but we audit them and determine and right now we're trying to audit about two and a half percent of the claims which uh, if if they do 50,000 well we'll do a you know 15 or uh, we'll do uh, yeah maybe 1,500 claims. Is this payment just a one-time only, what they get? Is that the maximum? It's a one-time one? only. It's fixed. It's a, it's a go, no-go. They either, if, once they cross the 50% probability mark, they get paid. If they don't, they don't get paid. Mm. And, of course, our, our meetings, our public meetings, transcripts, uh, we have a court reporter there, so everything is done in the open. Right. It's under the sunshine laws. So we we can't make any decisions unless they're they're done openly, and of course the the and the public is allowed to comment at the meetings and so on. And of course the ones who tend to attend are the unsuccessful ones. So um, we have some very angry well, people often at our meetings. So that's one of the challenges is keeping your cool. <laughs> Anyway, so I, I've been doing that, and then I'm, I'm still on a, a board of the National Academy of Sciences that deals with nuclear and radiation things. And just this summer completed a term on the board of the Radiation Effects Research Foundation, which is uh, a Japanese organization that is studying the survivors of the nuclear weapons. And that program has been going on since 45, the end of the war. Is it still going on? Still going on, yeah. Oh. Yeah. There's many survivors, uh, people who did not live close enough. These are people from around Hiroshima and Nagasaki. If they did not live close enough to be uh, killed by heat and blast, then they, they typically survived, but they got high radiation exposures. And um, that was a whole population of ages, but the younger ones are all still living. And, and what they look at there is the, the incidence of cancer mainly in these and then in their children. So they, they're looking the at offspring, the, right. the offspring. So sure. that's a vast study because uh, there's thousands and thousands of people in that study. And, and interestingly enough, and uh, they're, you know, they're the, even though they were exposed to pretty high levels from the weapon, uh, it's even in that population, it's actually fairly difficult to detect much difference in the cancer incidence from a normal population. So, but the, the numbers of people, that's big enough so you can get good statistics on it. And, and the Japanese data becomes the basis for all the radiation standards around the world, sure. including the numbers that we use in this compensation program. Those are all based on the Japanese You've got data. Good, good statistics yeah, that, are, yeah. that are valid yeah, and, yeah. and help with people. Yeah, so it's very interesting. Right. Yeah. Um, got a favorite memory of Purdue or an outstanding event that hmm. comes to mind? Well, that's interesting. Let's see. You know, there's so many memories. Uh, some of them are athletic memories. You know, Marilyn and I went to the Rose Bowl and the team Both of them? No, we didn't go to the first one. Oh, that, okay. That was early on. We, when we were very young, and that was a, the trip was not doable for us. But, but things like that. Um, oh, I, I think of the events in the end. Uh, you know, we were here. Fred Hubdy was the president when we were here. And uh, I think of the transition uh, during the, the late 60s and early 70s, those years. We, when did you join? Clinton? I came, it'll be 40 years in July. I came in 68. 
Yeah, you were here about the time when the, the those protests. Uh, I, I'm not sure I'd call that a favorite memory, but it, it is a... Uh, you remember, recall. I, I, yeah, I, I, was I there. remember the, the events surrounding that and and the the uh, the difficulties Fred Hovde had. I was on the search committee that brought in Art Hansen, mm. so I, that, that sort of... Uh, reinforce some of that too because in those those days and the the input from students uh, even on the selection of the president was much different than it is today right. when you think of those kinds of things so so there's been a lot of transitions over the years uh, that you think about uh, I think about certain individuals along the line that you know people like Hubdi who always had the open house at his home and you'd go there and Right, on the South Seventh Street. Right, and I think about um, some of the early characters. Dean Jenkins was a very interesting character. I don't know if people told you much about him. Not but, really, no. Well, let me tell you one thing about Dean Jenkins. Please do. This is interesting because I learned very quickly after I arrived. Because he, he was the dean when you he came. He was the dean, and Dean Jenkins expected everybody to work six days a week. I mean, this was not written down anywhere, but I learned from my colleagues, I better be over there on Saturdays. Don't take Saturday morning off. And Did you have Saturday classes in those days? There were some Saturday classes, but the expectation was if you had a Saturday class, you'd sort of make it up somehow, that, at least in my mind. But then I learned from my colleagues, no, we don't work 40 hours. Well, of course, no faculty member does, but at least on paper, right. Saturday's a day off. But uh, Dean Jenkins expected you to work on Saturdays, and Dean Jenkins visited every faculty member's lab every Saturday, and that was that was a, the Saturday walkthrough. <laughs> and so once you learned that that was how things worked, <laughs> uh, when you went on on a Saturday morning, you checked around with your colleagues, and the first question you asked was, "Has the dean been through yet?" If he had been through, <laughs> then you had to figure out some way where you were going to have to ask him a question that would require you to go to his office. You had to, you had to come up with something. If he'd already been through and, and you weren't there. And you were you, parking your car. Yeah, you better get over there so he knew you were on duty. So, That's that, interesting. So that was a kind of an interesting sidelight. And, and, and even I, I know on the Hubdy visits, when when the faculty members went over to to Hovde's, the first thing they wanted to do was find Dean Jenkins, and make sure he saw them there at Hovde's. Because he, he said his philosophy was, if the president invites you to his house, you better go. There was no skipping that. You better go, and so faculty members made sure when they went to Hovde's they visited the dean. <laughs> So that's kind of you a... You got to stay for the whole affair. <laughs> well, as long as you made sure the dean saw you, then you're free to leave. But I, I always... Uh, it's kind of a, a funny early memory of Purdue, I guess. But uh, And then Dean yeah. Tyler was, was the dean for a long time. Yes, uh -huh. right. I, and it, it was kind of interesting that Dean Tyler w became aware of Dean Jenkins' requirement. He actually told the faculty they weren't actually required to be there Saturday mornings if their schedule was such that they, you know, you, you basically said, set your own schedule. I'm not going to be walking around checking on you <laughs> Saturday mornings. Uh, but uh, let's see. What else can I say about Purdue? Or any general comments? It's something that I didn't ask that you'd like to share kind of in closing. I really wanted to wrap it up. Um, it comes to mind. <clears throat> No, I, I, the, the only general thing I'll say is I, I found Purdue to be really a, an excellent place to work. Uh, I've enjoyed my colleagues over the years, and I think even, even with the growth of Purdue, there's still a kind of family uh, feeling that many places I don't think have. Um, the... Um, and, and it, it shows up in many different facets of it Purdue. Uh, 
Uh, we, I didn't mention, Marilyn and I have been very interested in the, the music at Purdue as well, even though you know, the old story, there's no music program there, but, but uh, we've had involvement over many years, starting with Al Stewart and, and on through and, and uh, with the Glee Club and, and the other programs. I'm currently a sire with the Glee Club, which, uh, and uh, so, but we, we knew Al Stewart well and his... They uh, do very well and many people, uh, I hear from people, we don't have a music school, but they have a marvelous oh, musical yeah. organization. Yeah, which, one, and the yeah. band, just starting with the band and, and the And the others. band as well, right. right. And uh, yeah, so, you know, there's a search for a new director now and, and I'm on that search committee for the, the new director of the Glee Club. but. Um, it, it's still a family feeling. All of those kinds of things, I think, have right. been good. And, and we're active in the Purdue retirees now, but uh, it's been good. And and I, I, the only other thing I would, I'll say this: that um, in, in John Christian was my mentor for my PhD, and and over the years, he and his wife. Uh, were very instrumental in opening the doors for Marilyn and me, both within Purdue and professionally. Uh, he always made sure I had funding to go to professional meetings, and always encouraged me to be active because part of part of what happens, um, like the the presidential appointment, although I don't know the details behind that, I can pretty well figure out that a lot of that kind of thing depends on networking and, and you're right. people at least knowing that you're, you might be okay for, for, for this. And, and uh, he, he made sure to uh, encourage not just me, but all, all of his faculty and students uh, to, uh, to expand out, to um, get involved professionally, uh, they always encouraged us to get involved organizationally with our professional organization as well as AAA, uh, the American Association for the Advancement of Science and things like Sigma Xi. Right. Uh, really, I think, went out of his way to make sure that that happened. And even in, in years when travel was tight, I, I remember the, the first meeting I attended after we moved here, there wasn't enough travel money for for more than one person to attend the annual meeting of the Health Physics Society, which was my mm -hmm. my thing. And uh, John and Kate Christian said, uh, you can ride with us. We'll, we'll drive out. And the meeting was out west. And, and uh, we did that, doubled up. And sure. So just things like that, which, you it know. It paid off, which was really yeah, right. Little things. Little things, up. little right. things, right. Right. And they, they did a lot of things, and the Christians especially did a lot of things socially to connect students and faculty members and administrators in their home, a lot of thing, activities like that. Right. So, yeah. so uh, I think uh, the attention given to sort of all, all aspects of your career, not just here at Purdue and not just your research, but uh, engaging uh, professionally engaging with other people on campus. Uh, Kay made sure Marilyn got involved with other, uh, at that time, the women's groups and so on, that kind of thing. Right. So, yeah. It's very good. I want yeah. to thank you very yeah. much, Dr. Zimmer, very sure. much. This concludes the interview. Thank you. Thank you.